Professor Scott Haley. He is a professor emeritus in the Department of Soil and Crop Sciences at the Colorado State University, USA. He served as a project leader of the Wheat Breeding and Genetics Program at Colorado State University from 1999 to 2020. His research focused on the genetic improvement of hard red and hard white winter wheat for yield, end use, quality, and biotic and abiotic stresses prevalent in Colorado and the central and southern Great Plains. He has led teams responsible for the development of 39 winter wheat cultivars, two wheat germplasm lines, and a novel wheat herbicide tolerance technology as a co-developer. He has served as major professor for 13 MS and nine PhD students and as graduate committee member for an additional 10 MS and 15 PhD students. He has authored and co-authored three book chapters, 113 peer-reviewed journal articles and many abstracts and popular press articles. He has provided many invited presentations, including 330 field day, field day or grower meeting talks since 1993 and 54 presentations to scientific or industry audiences. He has also been active in undergraduate and student mentoring and service for the wheat industry in Colorado in the USA and internationally. We are highly honored and privileged to have him with us on the BioEngine platform and we look forward to learning from his life's works and experiences. Thank you. All right. Uh, good morning. Um, good morning. A lot of our viewers are masters and PhD students. So for the first question, if you could please share your journey as a plant scientist for our viewers. Well, I touched upon this a little bit in that brief introduction that I gave. Um, uh, my journey, some things about my journey. I, I grew up in the suburbs. I, I grew up, as I mentioned, I grew up far from agriculture. My dad was a businessman, you know, and um, but I went to the land grant college, Washington State University, and, and I liked plants, like botany, and just wasn't sure, like, you know, how do I apply botany? How do I get a job in botany? And um, so I, I just by chance, really, it's a funny thing about life, right? You know, you don't always pick, um, you may get to choose some things, but choices are presented to you. And if you're lucky or if you're smart, right, you pick the right choices. And so I, I uh, became involved in crop breeding when I was in, um, as, as, a, uh, as an undergraduate student, didn't really ever think that that was going to be how I would spend my career. And uh, you know the the thing that really did it for me, you know, you talk about my journey. I mean, if there's like one thing that was most important, it was my experience in in the Peace Corps in Africa. And I I uh, lived in a an extremely poor country at that time, probably still is one of the ten poorest countries on the world. There was um, this was in the early '80s, and we had there was drought throughout Africa. And um, unfortunately, there was starvation throughout the continent. I don't know what the numbers are. You can go look at it on Google. And, um, and uh, you know, I, I just saw that, you know, plant breeding was a way that, that uh, you know, you could do something about that. And, um, you know, I know that not everything is plant breeding, right? You know, we have different other aspects of agricultural research, but but um, you know, plant breeding and the thing, one of the things I really liked about it, like it was, it was direct, right? A, a tangible, you know, the most exciting part of my career was to develop a tangible product and put that out in a farmer's field. And if you're lucky, the farmer accepts that variety because it, it improves their bottom line. So, so in terms of the journey, you know, there were, uh, I, I guess, um, luck, I, I guess, I guess I was smart enough. <laughs> Right, to get through graduate school and succeed as a professor, but um, really luck, luck is really important. I've, I've heard the expression that luck has the smell of perspiration, because if, if you, if you, that's another maybe, you know, overriding theme is that if you're willing to work hard, I came, I came from the suburbs, I 
you know, what do I know about agriculture or genetics or plant breeding? And, um, but I wanted it. I wanted to work hard. And um, if you work hard, um, I just feel that anything is possible. So I don't know, those are maybe just some, some uh, more overriding thoughts in terms of my journey. If you had a follow-up question about anything, I'd be happy to entertain that. Great. It also sounded like you have to jump on those opportunities that are presented to you as well. Um, so I think you, you mentioned, you know, wanting to help people um, in a tangible way. Uh, is that your main motivation for building a long career in science or are there other things as well? Well, I mean, I, I got married and I had children. So, I mean, you know, the other, the other reason, right, is, you know, you need to have a job and you need to pay the bills um, and, you know, wanting to do, you know, you know, have a secure situation for your family and education and housing and things like that. So let's face it, that was, that was always a primary motivation, but I don't know, my, my experience in Africa just, it changed me, you know, to see people that don't have food. And um, so that, that, um, yeah, I, I just saw that, okay, you know, we, we, we all, right, would like to do something that has impact and has meaning. Not every one of us gets to, you know, receive a Nobel Prize or, you know, some other big award, right? But, um, uh, you know, I just, uh, it just to me seemed like it was a way that I could make an impact. And then at the later stages of my life, be happy looking back that I had done something for humanity. Right, but uh, you know, when I was 20 years old, I didn't think about doing anything for humanity. You know, I just started to figure out how to get a job. So, great, thanks. Um, do you think the available agricultural practices will be enough to feed 10 billion people, uh, or is there need for improvement to attain food security? So I, I had made a note, I had printed these out and just uh, thought about it just for a couple of minutes. There's always a need. I, I get frustrated when I, you know, see different people on the internet or, you know, funding agencies or whatever talk about, you know, agricultural research as if it's something that you, you do and then you're done, you know? We, there's always room for improvement. We have to get more from arable land or we, I mean, the alternatives, right? Or to, I guess one of the other, well, in this question was a 10 billion, you know, do, does that come from, you know, growing crops in the desert? Probably not. Does that grow from cutting down rainforests? I mean, this is happening in many parts of the world. Hopefully not as much, but what we have to have is is greater productivity per unit area of land. And how, do, how does that come? I mean, that, you know, farmers, farmers I've, I've felt over time, at least the ones that I've been fortunate enough to interact with, they're the, they're the greatest innovators, right? Not all of them, but, you know, the ones that are still in business in, uh, here in Colorado, they're the great innovators. But, you know, where do those innovations come from? I mean, they don't, they don't come from, you know, just out of thin air, they, they come based on research, on ag research. And, um, you know, be it genetics, be it, uh, be it uh, you know, we, we need to get more biomass produced for each unit of nitrogen that the farmer applies. You know, we, we have tremendous challenges in terms of, you know, evolution of, of uh, crop pests, as I talked about, and, and diseases. That's not gonna stop. And, um, you know, your, your, your question, you know, says available agricultural practices. Well, what do, what do we mean about available? You know, I, uh, one, one of the other questions is what's my opinion on GM crops and what's my opinion on CRISPR genome editing? And, and it just shocks me, you know, that, 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 um, uh, where, that, 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 well, these are available, right? That they're not available in wheat, at least GMO, right? We don't have GMO wheat anywhere in the US. Well, what if we had GMO wheat that would take care of this wheat stem soft light problem? I don't, I don't know. I don't know how we would develop that. It's not my area, but um, sure, that's available. But we're not being allowed, we're not 
uh, being able to use it as we, as we might, you know, due to the influence of different groups or different people that may have their own agendas in, in one way or another. So, um, so I, I guess that to sum up my long rambling answer here is no, I, I do not think that our available agricultural practices are enough. We need a continual investment. We need greater investment and a continual, you know, long-term investment in agricultural research in all ways, Be because there's there's things that that um, we can't even right. When I started my career, I couldn't even conceive of whole genome sequencing. Well, what other technology do we not know about yet that will be able, you know, that we'll be able to use 20 years from now? And it's going to happen, right? And um, so, no, we don't have all of the available tools. We have to do much, much more. Yep, I agree. You'll you'll <laughs> you'll learn that my my answers <laughs> my answers are kind of long and winding here. So that's fine. That's great. Um, in your long career in wheat research, uh, have you noticed any effects of global warming on wheat agriculture? You already touched on this, but the, the, the short, the short, the short answer is yes, and um, you know the long, the long answer is you know this is this is in the U.S. and um, maybe less so in many other countries, but in the U.S. this is a political thing, right? Do we have, you know, is is climate change real? Are humans causing it? And and it's a political thing here in the U.S. Um, I, and I'm, I'm this is you know I'm not a you know, a, a, a scientist in this area, but as a scientist, I listen to other scientists. And I think the preponderance of evidence states that, yeah, this is happening. And in terms of what I've seen is, is like, you know, farmers that I may interact with, um, oh, they'll, they'll, some of them, not all of them, but some of them may deny that, that uh, climate change is occurring, or if it is occurring, it's, you know, it's just na a natural thing and we're not causing it. It's not related to CO2. And uh, I've seen a change in them. I think the farmers that are on the land here that I've interact that I interact with have interacted with, they've seen it, and slowly, their thinking has changed. Not all of them, but quite a number of them. Then, in in terms of maybe more tangible things, I mean, why why do we why is stripe rust a problem for us now? Why is wheat stem sawfly a problem for us now? And and um, you know, temperature shifts are have to be some part of that, and how that impacts cropping systems, how that impacts the agro ecosystem, and then last but not least, um, we've gone from two two straight years here in Colorado of having really high temperatures, you know, like 30, 35, 37 degree temperatures during grain filling, and. Um, I, I can go back 27 years when I started and okay, you know, you'd have heat and heat, heat was kind of something that was more important for the spring wheat breeders, not so much for the winter wheat breeders because the, you know, the winter wheat would mature before the spring wheat, but that's not the case anymore. And um, so, um, yeah. So yes, I've, no, I've noticed the effects is the short answer. Yes. <laughs> great, well, not great. Um, okay, so the next question you definitely touched on in your presentation, but maybe you want to uh, give a little recap. Um, have you witnessed any particular insect pests of wheat that were considered to be minor pests, but at first, um, but have suddenly or recently become major pests? Well, I, I talked about the weed stem sawfly, and that's yeah. that's. <laughs> I don't know what else I need to say about that. It was kind of interesting. I, I started to, uh, you know, one, one of the problems that plant breeders have is like, you know, when you're when you're working, I don't know, what, 60 hours a week or whatever, um, you know, just trying to do your job. And, and uh, you know, how do you, how do you breed for things that aren't problems yet? And, and we've been working on UG99 stem rust resistance and we, you know, we started to work on wheat blast and, and, um, and we had started to work on wheat stem sawfly, you know, before it was acknowledged or realized that we had a problem, you know, because I was thinking, okay, I better be ready. But, you know, in, in retrospect, I wasn't ready. I should, I should have started five years earlier, but hindsight's 2020. So, so that is one. 
Um, I, I, I had been keeping my eyes. There's, there's another insect pest, um, not insect, another fungal pathogen, uh, sorry, 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 insect pest called the orange wheat blossom midge, which is a problem in Canada. It's a problem in some parts of Europe, problem up in the northern part of the US. I'm, th I'm thinking, you know, when is that going to be a problem here? And, you know, we have to start making the crosses and getting ready for that. And um, so, uh, so in any case, to answer your question, I mean, the wheat stem sawfly was one. Um, it's kind of interesting that, you know, as the wheat stem sawfly becomes more important, Russian wheat aphid becomes less important. And I think that's just kind of an interesting, interesting aspect of things. Fortunately, we haven't had to work on everything and we can prioritize. Yeah. Uh, next question is, do you think organic farming is possible in a large scale commercial agricultural system? Agricultural system. Um, I'll, I'm going to say something maybe controversial here. Um, no, I mean, I, I think the basic answer is no. And, um, you know, the, the follow up to that would be without a science based appraisal of technologies that might help organic agriculture. And this is this really frustrates me here in the US, you know, that the proponents of, of our, our organic agriculture here in the US, um, you know, just want to leave GMO or gene editing or mutagenesis or whatever, you know, new technologies. And, you know, we want to grow 80 year old wheat varieties because they taste better. <laughs> maybe that's true, maybe that's not, but, but um, that, that, um, that, 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 um, you know, we, why can't we bring to bear other technologies to make organic farming sustainable? Because I don't, I don't believe organic farming is sustainable. Um, there's all sorts of different ways that we can, we can measure sustainability. Soil health is one. Tillage is not good uh, here in, in our area. And uh, organic farming depends on tillage. Uh, weeds become a problem. I, I mean, I talk to many farmers who say, well, I, I thought about organic ag, my neighbor did something and now he's got an 80 acre or what would this be like a 40, 40 hectare plot of land or whatever that's full of perennial weeds. And uh, it's not a sustainable agricultural practice if, if we're looking at having 10, 10 billion people, what, if, what about a GMO trait that allows the wheat plant to be twice or the soy maize plant or rice plant or whatever to be twice as efficient with each nitrogen ion? Why, why would that not be a good thing for, for organic agriculture? But um, so there's tremendous opportunities, but unfortunately I think, um, those, those that uh, either they have an economic stake in, in organic products and selling organic agriculture, um, maybe, maybe that's the predominant way, but, but they're, I think the minority is, is, uh, out, uh, is out, uh, shouting the majority in, in this. But you know, in the future, right? In the, in the present with climate change and moving into the future population challenges, how can we, how can we not embrace technology. And I am old enough to remember, you know, listening to Norman Borlaug talk about technology and about nitrogen fertilizer. Explain to me how a nitro, you know, nitrogen fertilizer from the Haber-Bosch process can't be used in organic egg. Well, where's the nitrogen come from? Well, if they have legumes in the rotation, maybe it comes from nitrogen fixation, but that's not enough. So, I, I get a little riled up, you know, when, when people talk about organic agriculture and that's okay, we can have an honest discussion about this. Yep, that's great. Um, according to you, which sectors of plant science research will prosper in the near future? Well, uh, I did have a few, few notes about that one here. Plant science research is a big thing, right? And uh, so I'd like to restrict my comments to breeding because that's what I know best. And um, you know we're 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 just kind of at a at a critical you know place in in plant breeding research. I feel you know where where we have 
you know, genome sequences of many, or if not all, the major food crops. And, you know, we're trying to figure out how to use this and how do we use that information to, to develop better crop varieties. And I, I see the development of uh, AI, artificial intelligence, which I have no idea what that really means, but uh, it sounds fancy. Machine learning, we tried to, you know, delve into this, you know, taking this enormous data set of climatological data or soil microbiome biome data or whatever and, and applying that in some way. You know, it's been into, I, I remember before we had computers, I hate to say it, but, um, you know, to, to see where we are, what we can do with computer technology now uh, compared to years ago, that's only gonna get better uh, in the future, allowing us to exploit more, you know, maybe larger, you know, climatological data sets uh, remote sensing, things like this, drones, and and then, um, you know, you know, in in terms of uh, gene editing, you know, being able to affect changes, precise changes in the genome, I, I think is is another area, you know. But but um, that I think will most optimally come be applied best when we look at it in the context of of modeling and machine learning and um, so data. Data intensiveness, I, I think, is, um, is is something that will prosper in the present as well as the near future. So. Great, thanks. The, the next two questions I had were about your opinion on GMO crops and CRISPR genome editing. However, I think you've answered uh, your opinion being pretty favorable. So I might uh, skip on to the next question. Um, we know that you're a reviewer for many renowned journals and editor of books. Can you give us some key takeaway messages to improve our manuscripts? Okay. I, I do want to go back to this GM very quickly, GM crops and gene, gene editing. I, yep. I recognize that um, regulation, you know, safety testing, you know, th these are not trivial and these are important. Right, so I'm, I'm not advocating, I don't think proponents of, of uh, transgenic crops would, would advocate just free and open, you know, uh, deployment of things without adequate testing, but it has to be reasonable and science and science-based. So enough said on that. So in terms of um, takeaway messages to improve manuscripts, um, I, I thought about this, you know, the, the first thing a lot of different ways to look at this, but um, you know, writing the manuscript is is the end of of a project. Is it's the end of a um, you know of work that was done. You know, some work that was done, and then you've got enough data, and then you're going to try to publish it. So, so you have the part about the manuscript itself, and you know, one needs to consider where. Is this going to be published? You know, does this go in some journal that nobody is ever going to see, or does it go in Science? You know, and uh, each journal has their own, you know, guide to authors. So, formatting and you know what's required of that journal is very important, and um, uh, you know the conduct of the research. I think many many people mistakes that I've seen, mistakes that I've made have been. Uh, you know, where you didn't really thoroughly, um, you know, plan out the research. It kind of, it kind of happened in, in, you know, ad hoc. Oh, you know, well, you didn't, you didn't have the luxury of, of planning it out as you would have liked to. And then when it gets time to write the thing, you realize, oh, I made some mistakes. And um, not all of those are fatal, but, um, you know, the, the thing that I try to, have always tried to encourage students to do is you know you have to be the master of the literature. You know what is the problem? <laughs> you know if you're going to work on yellow rust or wheat stem soft, what have people already done? How is that related to your current? Uh, you know your viewpoint of of that problem, and then the whole hypothesis generating process. And um, if, if you as a, as a young researcher are, are not really clear about that, that you know, what, was been, what was done, how does that relate to what you need to do 
and and from that comes the hypotheses for the work, right? Then you have objectives. How am I going to you know try to address these hypotheses? If you don't get that right, right, you're going to regret it. And so so I would just I try to encourage any student when they come is just spend you know six months or whatever, and you have to be the master of the literature because. Your advisor, you know, is worrying about all these different things, and um, uh, you know, not not to any great extent on any one of them. So you have to be the expert as as the, as the student. Um, so you know, writing a research proposal is really important because that I've always encouraged students to do that because that's where you get that done. If if you haven't thought about it and you don't have clear hypotheses. Then you know the whole thing is, you know stands a strong chance of falling apart. So I think hypothesis development is critically important and probably oftentimes overlooked. And I've been guilty of that myself. You know everything that you that you do in terms of the conduct of the experiments and then writing up those they they depend directly on what were your hypotheses. You know, you have a hypothesis that this occurs or that doesn't occur or whatever. And well, how am I going to test that? How am I going to test that in an experimental sense? Like what kinds of materials and methods am I going to use? How am I going to analyze, how am I going to collect and analyze data? And, and then from that comes interpretation of the data. So if, if, you're if you don't have hypotheses, you need to have some. some sometimes I think, and I've been the, the biggest violator of this, not having clear hypotheses, and um, it's it's super important because everything comes comes back. So, then last but not least is is just writing. Um, you know, writing is uh, something that takes time, and and it's an organic. I've found for myself it's been an, it's an organic process in the sense that you uh, you don't you don't just sit down and write a thirty page manuscript in a day, right? It takes time. And it takes, you know, thinking about it. How best can I tell my story, you know, in, in this paper? Uh, and 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 if the writing is not clear and concise and grammatically correct, and all these just basic writing things, if that's not um, done in a proper way, you know, for whatever journal it is you're trying to publish in, then. It's, it's almost in a sense that it doesn't matter what your hypotheses are and how you conducted the research if you can't communicate it. So if writing is not your strength, work on it more. And then uh, if, if English or whatever is whatever your first language is, um, if you're trying to publish in a different language, and if that's not really strong for you, find people uh, you know, who can help with that. So, so those are just some, some, uh, some basic ideas. Great. That was really, really good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So when you're recruiting a new member or research fellow to your lab, uh, what qualities are you looking for, which are maybe outside the academic histories or publication lists? Well, I had, I had written down uh, here, writing skills and technical skills. So mm -hmm. what has the person done? Um, you know, what kinds of, do, do they know how to extract DNA and, you know, do they know how to go to the field and take a note or, you know, can they use R or can they use Python or, or do they know how to do machine learning or, you know, whatever. So, so you, ha you have all of that, right? And so I, I guess the question is, well, aside from that, um, I, I guess communication is the first one, you know, when, when, um, you know, when somebody's approaching me, right? You know, do you have a job, you know, or do you, you know, you're looking to hire a new graduate student or a new employee? How am I contacted? And, um, you know, that, that initial contact is, is enormously important. I've, I've always been impressed by the, by the student or the, uh, the postdoc or whatever, who, who says, you know, well, I've, I've, I've done a little bit, bit of background on your work or whatever. And, you know, I'd like to call you and discuss. And I have some questions, but I'm I'm not. You know, I've you have you have to put time into this, right? You and I and I know that's a challenge. If you if you're trying to, uh, you know, you're a, you're a student or a postdoc, um, and you know you're you're trying to uh, find a position, and 
you know, it's almost like it doesn't matter. Are you going to work in maize? Are you going to work in wheat or rice or whatever? It's hard to be an expert in, in all areas. But if you're applying for, for example, to work in wheat, well, you better know a little bit about wheat and what's going on in that area and what you can bring to the table and communicate that in your first contact with the, with the individual that you're contacting. That first contact, you, you better not have spelling and grammatical errors in that email. And um, I've, I've just always thought that, you know, making that personal contact, very seldom when I was like filling graduate student positions, very seldom did I like put out a formal announcement, you know, um, gather, you know, a, a bunch of applications and pick the best one. I, I usually found the students based on some sort of informal contact. Somebody contacted me. Here's why I want to come work with you. So, so in that process, communication is just, you know, especially important. So the other, the other thing is, you know, having, having uh, done other things other than your, your academic, you know, career development path, you know, do you, um, you know, have you volunteered in the schools or, um, you know, do you have other, you know, not like, you know, gee, I like to play the guitar or things like that, but, but, um, what other kinds of things have you done, you know, in your spare time, right? To like help that, that, that has always made a big impression on me that somebody who, um, you know, volunteers for the elderly or something like that, because, because I was, I was that person. I, I, I was not a, a very good student and, you know, but my advisor, <laughs> I, I came back from Africa and I wanted to be a plant breeder and my advisor saw that in me and gave me a chance. So, and it, it likely wasn't based on my GPA or the skills that I had. It was, I expressed my commitment to what I wanted to do. And here's why I want to do it there. So I don't know if that's what, what uh, if that helps at all, but. No, that's wonderful. Um, okay, so our final question for this interview round, um, what words of advice could you give the students and scholars who are new to the field of plant science research? Well, the first one that just comes immediately to mind, I, I said it already, is that anything is possible if, if you're willing to work for it. And um, not everybody's willing to work, <laughs> right? And so you see a lot of, a lot of variation in that. But, um, you know, if, if um, you know, again, plant science research is kind of a broad area. I mean, let's just maybe bring that back to plant breeding. Why do you want to be a plant breeder? What, what in your past has influenced you that that's what you want to do for your career path? And um, so, you know, in, in that area, I guess, you know, advice, advice would be to, you know, you know, depending, I know, opportunities are different throughout the world, but, you know, become involved in a program, right? If, if you think that plant breeding is something you're going to be interested in as a career, well, you better, it would be advantageous to have more experience than just, I took a class in plant breeding. Well, what I did was I also worked in this, you know, plant breeding program as, a, as an intern or a volunteer, or they paid me and I did this kind of research project. And more, myself included, but more undergraduate students that have worked in our program, gone on to graduate school and plant breeding, become plant breeders. That's how it happened for them, was to become involved in a program in some way. So I, I think that would, you know, transcend just like breeding and maybe go out to this broader area of plant science research, become involved in a research program in some way. And, um, and, and then, you know, be involved in like things like this, you know, try, try to try to identify leadership opportunities is, is another thing, you know, can, can you work with people and, and how can you, can you work in groups and, and um, get along with people and things like that. Um, you know, may, maybe building your career, not just in the, in the classroom setting, but well, I was also involved in this group right? The, the students, you know, in agriculture association at my university or whatever. And in that capacity, we did this and we did that. And, um, you know, where you have some, you know, we organized a, a book 
drive for kids in the schools or whatever, right? There's any number of different that that I wasn't just involved in this organization, right? I not I didn't only have a leadership position in this organization, but here's what we did, and here was my role in this. That um, I, I think students have to be thinking about that. So I'm not sure that asking, well, <laughs> asking an old guy what the, you know, for students just getting into the career, it would be, um, it's possible. If, if you wanna be, you know, a crop breeder or a genomics, it's possible if, if you're willing to work. And um, so that, that's, that's the most important thing. Wonderful. I really like your attitude, that's great. Um, okay, so this winds up the Q&A uh, session.